a role. The, the same, I, I would do the same if I was playing, you know, I, I haven't done it yet and I may never, but if I was playing a boxer, I'd have to learn to box. If, if I, you know, in, in playing the, in the Marvel films, I'd, I do do a lot of physical training because I fight a hell of a lot and I do a specific um, kind of training because he fights in a very specific kind of way. Mm. You just have to do as much as you can. That's all, that's all, that's all really. Fantastic. And uh, now the gentleman in the front row, we'll get to you guys in a second. Tom, first of all, congratulations on yet another astonishing performance. Um, Thank you. You've worked with some extraordinary Thank filmmakers, you know, Woody, um, Ken of Branagh, but I think by your own admission, Stephen's something special and unique. I wonder what you think as a performer you've learned specifically from Stephen that you maybe haven't from anyone you've worked with before. And also as, as an admitted boyhood fan, um, is there a particular Stephen film, uh, apart from War Horse, that touched you when you were younger and, and can maybe talk a little bit about why he as a filmmaker has meant so much to you? He goes a great, great question. Um, it's so hard to think of one thing that I learned from him. Um, what, I, what, what I was most inspired by is that with his filmography and his CV and his standing and position in this business, um, his passion and curiosity and integrity and joy for the whole thing, for making films, um, understanding the responsibility of the numbers of people who are going to watch those films, is as present as it must have been when he first picked up a camera. He, he just loves it so much. He never takes a second for granted. He still gets frightened. What am I going to do today? Um, his ability to improvise and, 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 um, and not set things in stone. That, that The magic of cinema is the magic of capturing life in its accidental form um, and not to lock things down and, and say it has to be this way. And as Richard was saying, his fluidity, his, his fleetness of foot and his sense of humor and his, it really his joy um, that a man like that could, could, see a, could see a story like this and think, yep, yeah, that's what I need to do. Um, I, I was just so moved by it that you know, I should be so lucky if I'm even still working at his age and with that kind of passion and integrity. Um, I've, I've, in the past, I've talked about Indiana Jones a lot, but, but, but I remember going to see Jurassic Park and it was I literally so t the war horse opens today and however many years ago it was the opening Friday of Jurassic Park I had badgered my mum and dad I was 12 to go and see the dinosaurs for weeks and they took me to the Odeon on Magdalen Street in Oxford where we lived and I drank so much Coca-Cola during the trailers <laughs> that by the time the T-Rex was about to stamp on Sam Neill uh, in that unforgettable sequence, I was so desperate for the loo. <laughs> but I couldn't go. Because to all intents and purposes, Steven Spielberg had created the childhood dream of seeing dinosaurs for me. And... I think that Steven Spielberg, in his, the course of his career, has, has every time changed the game. And he's created what has before seemed impossible. Um, and in a way, we're so used to it now, to, to, to computer-generated monsters, that we forget the impact that that made. You are actually looking at dinosaurs with people in a, in a, film, a film that seemed to be within the bounds of plausibility, sort of. Um, but stick Richard Attenborough in it and pretend it's his park and you'll believe anything. Um, and I, I, just, I just loved it. And I saw it again, I think, the following day and didn't drink any Coca-Cola. <laughs> and, um, and I remember even, even this is a, the first time I've admitted this in public, my first professional theatre job um, was a play called The Changeling, which we took around Europe uh, with a, a company called Cheek by Jowl. And I shared a dressing room with a very good friend of mine called Lawrence Spellman, who's also an actor. And for some reason, our dressing room door reminded us of the kitchen door <laughs> in uh, Jurassic Park, <laughs> where the kids are trying to get away from the raptors. And I, ha I got sent the other day by him, in sort of the spirit of Spielberg, a video of myself as a velociraptor, <laughs> um, shot only about five years ago, <laughs> under a theatre in Paris, 
um, trying to get in to eat the children. So one could say it's had a very lasting impact. That's very dangerous. Is there any way we can tempt you to do the <laughs> Flutter Raptor tonight? <laughs> Damn it. No. Uh, Richard, no. <laughs> maybe. Uh, Richard, can I throw the same question to you? Oh, there we go. Amazing. <laughs> it was the walk. It was all about the walk. I had the walk down. And the, the call. The claw, yeah. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Never knew you'd see that tonight when you came yeah. out, did you? Um, Richard, can I throw the, the same question to you very quickly? What well, I, the, 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 the movie I talked to Stephen a little bit about uh, while we were working on this was, in fact, Close Encounters. Because mm. I've always thought Close Encounters was a very curious and symphonic movie. It's a movie that just keeps moving towards its destination. It hasn't got a plot like a... It's sort of... It's just slowly building via mashed potato to the... <laughs> just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more satisfying. just continues to grow. And, and I was just was always saying, you're a master of unusual narrative and there's no reason we should be frightened to make the, the way this movie operates mm. uh, uh, unusual as well. So I think in some ways Close Encounters, I think one of his most marvellous films. Fantastic. Uh, sadly, we've only got time for one more question. Uh, I saw you uh, first, so uh, yeah, this lady here. Thank you. Sorry, people behind me and people on the, on the right. I hope it's a good one. I feel <laughs> the honour of this. Um, Tom, you touched on it a little bit before when you talked about the sounds of the swords clanking and how that kind of brought you into the moment of the charge. And I just wanted to ask a little bit how you brought in the authenticity of that time period, how the props contributed to it, how the speech contributed to it, how that impacted your performance and kind of the lengths you went to as a crew to ensure that was as authentic as possible. Well, I start with the dialogue. I mean, my first line is, is, um, is full of such... Uh, military formality that it, 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 it um, I spent a lot of time acting in period as well, it's just weird, but my, the, my first line to Peter Mullen's character is, and how much are you charging, sir, for this strong, decent and very fine animal? And even just the adjective fine is, 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 is something that, that conjures up a world to me, you know, um, a very fine thing, you know, the, the sort of, the, it was a very I don't know, it just, it just gives me a sense of, of what it must have been like. And um, I'm just so lucky that, that, that Stephen's resources are, are, are so um, abundant that, that I had the best, the best of, of everything around me. I had the best groomsmen looking after the horses. I had the most beautiful costume, um, quite literally um, crafted to my exact measurements. Um, with, 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 with authentic material and by, you know, ad advised by brilliant military historians as to the specifics of things. Every insignia, all, all the belts and buckles, it was all sort of um, as it should have been. And um, we were taught by the, those same historians about protocol and the instructions you would say. And it was a very technical thing. And there are only three CGI shots in the movie. Yeah. So it was very authentic experience. And none of they the CGI shots that. involved anything that I was part of or, or our section. That They're all Tom's hair. <laughs> <laughs> and eyes, yeah. yeah. And face, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Richard, um, how hard do you strive as a writer to evoke that sense of period, not just in the dialogue, but in, in directions and general mood? Do you know, actually, it cuts both ways with me. I would probably say I was the least authentic insofar as... You know, my, I felt my, I was charged with trying to make the people <coughs> as, I, we did this in Blackadder, this strange mixture of making sure you're right mm. and not having anything which is anachronistic. But then within how you think people talk in that situation to make them as normal and chatty and friendly as you can. So in a way, I'm always fighting against the restrictions of that so that you can find as many modern cadences, because I don't think people have changed mm. all yeah. that much in many ways. So. Although the dialect would have done. I mean, the thing, the thing is, if we'd actually spoken in a, in a dialect that was, in, that was absolutely true to the time, it would have, I think, seemed alienating to an audience, it, it, because it was, the vowel sounds are so different and so clipped. I mean, and, and, and people's voices were higher just naturally, so it would have been, you know, and how much you charging, sir, for this strong, decent, and very fine animal. <laughs> and I think, I, th I, I personally can't, I can't relate, I think it's admirable when I yeah. see that, but I can't relate to it. Yeah. And so there has to be, you have to meet it halfway, I think. 